So we're going to start off just talking about contraction of whole muscles. Now I'll tell you that physiologically, how a whole muscle contracts is the same way as how one cell contracts. Um, it's just lots of cells doing it at once. So physiologically, it's the same thing, but there are some terms we're going to walk through. So there's actually two types of muscle contractions, right? If you're looking at like your bicep contracting, one is isometric and one is isotonic. So the term iso, that prefix should not be new, okay? You probably have heard of that before. Remember when we talked about things like isotonic solutions in general biology, the term iso just means same. So isometric, metric, think length. So isometric means, oh, sorry, same length. So this is when your muscle is contracting, but you're not changing the length of the muscle. Um, so you're putting tension on the muscle, but you're not changing the length. So let me give you some examples. Um, if you're doing sit-ups, you know, and you're coming up and going down, coming up and going down, let's say you come up and you just hold it. That's an isometric contraction. You've got tension on the muscle. You can feel your abdominal muscles contracting, but when you're holding it, you're just up and holding it, you're not changing the length of that muscle. Same thing as let's say you're doing squats up and down, and let's say you do a squat and you hold it down. That's an isometric contraction. You've got tension on all those muscles in your legs, but you're not changing the length of the muscle. You're just holding it in that one position, okay? Isometric. Isotonic is you have tension on the muscle and you're changing the length. So an isotonic contraction would be like doing your crunches up and down or doing your squats up and down, right? There's tension on the muscle and it's constantly changing length, okay? So isometric and isotonic. So when we talk about a whole muscle contracting, right? Think of like your bicep. I told you that physiologically it's the same as like one cell contracting. So we actually say that inside of your muscles, we have what are called motor units. So a motor unit is that one neuron that's coming in and all the muscle cells or muscle fibers that it's going to hit. Because remember, a muscle cell only contracts when a neuron tells it to contract, right? When that impulse comes down the neuron. So that neuron, when it comes into the muscle, it's going to branch and hit a bunch of cells in the muscle. So that one neuron and all those cells are considered a motor unit. So I'm going to show you a picture of a motor unit, and I'll come right back to that slide, okay? So here's a picture. Let's say we're looking at your bicep muscle. So you can see here's the whole muscle down here. We pulled out one fascicle, right? And here's all the cells within that fascicle, okay? Now up here, they're trying to show you your spinal cord. There's a spinal nerve coming off and it's gonna go into that muscle. And so let's say right here in red, this is one neuron coming in and you can see this neuron is gonna hit this muscle cell here, this muscle cell here, and this muscle cell here. So that neuron, that red one, and those three muscle cells make up what's called a motor unit. Okay, we can do the same thing with the purple one. There's another motor unit right here in purple, and you can see it's hitting these two cells. So that's a different motor unit. Okay, so a motor unit is the neuron and all the muscle cells within the muscle it's hitting. So we can say that the number of cells in a motor unit can vary. You can have just a few, like the picture I just showed you, or you can have several hundred cells within a motor unit. So that neuron can come in and hit hundreds of cells. Typically, muscles that control very fine movements, like fingers, your eyes, moving your eyes around, those have very small motor units. So a neuron comes in and hits just a few cells. Big weight-bearing muscles, these are large motor units. That neuron comes in and it's gonna hit hundreds of muscle cells within that muscle. Now, it also makes sense that the muscles, muscle cells within a motor unit, they're spread out throughout the muscle. So if you've got a large motor unit, let's say we're looking at like your quadricep, your leg muscles, big weight-bearing muscle. If you've got a neuron coming in and it's gonna hit 
500 cells within that muscle. A lot of times those 500 cells are not in one little area, they're spread out throughout the muscle. So that if only that one neuron fires, then you get a smooth contraction in the muscle. You don't get like a weird contraction on one little part of the muscle. The whole thing's going to contract, okay? So you can kind of see that in this picture as well, right? You can see that, you know, motor unit two, for example, it's not hitting three cells all right next to each other. They're kind of spread out a little bit. Okay. So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of different kinds of contractions that we can see in our whole muscles, okay? So one of them is something called a muscle twitch. A muscle twitch is your muscle's response to one single brief stimulus. So you got an impulse coming down a neuron, muscle's gonna, that one cell is gonna contract and it's gonna contract and relax, then you're done. This is not how our muscles usually work. Um, this is something we usually, if we want to see a twitch, we investigate it in a lab, but this is not usually how our muscles are working, okay? So there's three phases to a muscle twitch. We have the first phase is called the latent period. So this is the very first few milliseconds after a stimulus. So in a lab, how we would do a twitch is we might hook somebody up to like an electrode, um, and the electrode would have an electrical signal going through it, like a, it like shock you, like a current. And a lot of times what we do is we put that electrode on a nerve. So instead of your brain sending a signal down a nerve into your muscle, we're bypassing your brain. And instead, we're going to use a little electrode and we're going to stick it on that nerve and we're going to send a shock into the nerve. That's going to then go into the muscle, okay? So the latent period is the first few milliseconds right after a stimulus is moving down a neuron, okay? So we can see right here in this sort of dark blue area, this is a latent period. So the latent period, if you notice, we've got, I'll orient you on this graph over here. This is the tension in the muscle on the y-axis. This is the time, and notice it's in milliseconds. This happens really fast. And you're gonna see graphs that look just like this throughout the rest of the lecture. Anytime you see a red arrow, that means there's an impulse coming down a neuron, okay? So at time zero, we send a signal through a neuron and notice that for these first few milliseconds, three or four milliseconds, nothing's happening. There's no tension in the muscle. This is because excitation contraction coupling is taking place. So I'm going to share a whiteboard and I'm just going to, if it lets me, okay. I'm going to just sort of jog your memory from what we talked about last week. Okay, so remember last week we have our neuron and we have our muscle cell. Right, and so we've got our T tubules. I'm not going to do this in different color this time. Terminal cisternae that store calcium. Okay, and then we've got our sarcomere, Z disc to Z disc. Thick filaments and thin filaments. Okay, we've got our synaptic vesicles with acetylcholine. We've got our acetylcholine receptors over here on this motor end plate. Okay, so remember, when an impulse comes down a neuron, calcium channels have to open. Synaptic vesicles have to move to the end of the axon and release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has to get picked up by these receptors. Sodium channels have to open. The membrane has to get depolarized, right? It's got to become positive on the inside. It's got to depolarize enough to hit threshold. Then if it hits threshold, which is negative 50, 55, we get an action potential, which is positive 30, that spreads all the way down the sarcolemma and down the T-tubes. That causes calcium to get released. Calcium causes troponin and tropomyosin to move off the active sites of actin. Myosin can form a cross bridge, and that sarcomere can get shorter. Sorry, that's really fast, and it looks terrible. It looks like a five-year-old drew it. 
But the reason I wanted to draw this out to jog your memory is I just told you the latent period is this time between an impulse coming down a neuron and the time that you get a contraction. You can see why there's a pause, right? All this stuff has to happen. And so that's just a few milliseconds, because remember, this is all really fast. So it, it's quick, but there's still going to be a pause. That's the reason for our latent period, okay? So let's go back here, okay? So that's our latent period. It's just that first few milliseconds from the time the impulse is coming down a neuron while excitation contraction coupling is happening. And then we have this period of contraction. That's when the sarcomere is getting shorter and the tension in the muscle is rising. So now you can see, if you look at the blue line, you can see that we've got tension going up, okay? That's cross bridges are forming, the sarcomere is getting shorter, tension in the muscle. And then we're done. We've gotten our contraction, so now the muscle is going to relax back out, okay? And as the muscle relaxes back out, we call that the period of relaxation. So we have a latent period, a period of contraction, and a period of relaxation, okay? So those are, this is a muscle twitch. We have one stimulus down here, the muscle contracts, relaxes, that's it. Again, not typically how your muscles work. You've probably had that weird eyelid twitchy thing that's not normal, right? That's usually from a local pH change. Um, it's not how your body normally works. It's not how your muscles are usually working. This, if we want to see it, we usually see it in a lab, okay? We'll hook someone up to an electrode and stimulate that muscle and get a twitch. Now, it depends on which muscle as to what the twitch might look like. So different muscles, depending on whether they are large weight-bearing muscles or smaller um, muscles that have more fine motor control, we're going to see different kinds of twitches. So down here you can see, again, we've got our stimulus. And this time we have three different muscles. So the first one is showing you a muscle called an, the extraocular muscle, a lateral, the lateral rectus muscle. This is a muscle in your eye, on the outside of the eye. Helps to move your eyes out to the side. And so again, we're going to see the same three phases, but we're just going to look at that blue line, right? So we have our latent period where nothing's happening, okay? It's the time that an impulse comes down a, ner comes down a neuron and gives the muscle time to contract. Okay, that muscle on your eye is going to contract and relax, and it does it within about 20 seconds, and twitches over. We give the exact same stimulus, same strength, same stimulus, to a muscle like in your calf, your gastrocnemius. That's the one in blue. Not blue, green. <laughs> That's the one in green. You can see the same thing. We have a latent period, but this time that same stimulus causes a different muscle, a more weight-bearing muscle, to contract and relax, and this time it takes almost 80 milliseconds for that twitch to happen. Another muscle, another one down in your leg called the soleus muscle, you can see that same stimulus, that twitch takes almost 200 milliseconds. So different muscles will respond different, differently to the same stimulus, okay? They'll either be really quick or they'll be a little bit slower. It just depends on the muscle. Now, how your muscles work every day, again, not through a twitch, how they work every day is through something called a graded response. The term graded, you're going to see this a lot. You'll see it in muscle physiology. You'll see it in neurophysiology. It just means that it varies. That's all that means. So a graded muscle response means that you're going to get variations in your contraction. That's normal. That's what we normally see. This is how our muscles function every day. So a graded muscle response is what we need for proper skeletal muscle contraction for just everyday movement. And what makes the response graded or varied, makes it different, is that we change the frequency of the stimulus, meaning our brain sends a signal faster and we'll get a different response. It sends a signal less signals or sends them slower, we're going to get a different response, okay? So that's one way they can be varied. The other is changing the strength of the stimulus. 
you give a stronger stimulus, you're going to get a stronger response from your muscles. <clears throat> so that's why we call it graded. Your brain can either send the signal very quickly or slowly, or it can send a really strong stimulus. Okay, so again, I'm just going to refresh you. This is a twitch. Here's a picture of a twitch. Again, a twitch is not a graded response. This is not how your muscles work. It's just what's happening in a lab typically. And so again, we have our latent period. Okay, the muscle contracts, relaxes back out. Okay, that's a twitch. Your muscles response to one single brief stimulus. This is a graded response. Notice it looks different. Okay, so in this response, what we see, we call this wave summation. What you're going to notice is down here, notice these red arrows. There's not just one, but there's multiple. And so what I want you to notice is that your muscle starts with no tension. Your brain sends a signal and your muscle is going to contract and relax. But notice it doesn't relax all the way before your brain sends another signal and it's going to contract even harder the second time because it's riding on the wave of the first one and it's going to start to relax and you send another signal and it's going to contract again even harder so this is why we call this wave summation the contraction is riding on the wave of the previous contraction so you get stronger and stronger and stronger contractions we also call this incomplete tetanus now the term tetanus, this does not refer to the bacterial infection tetanus. This is referring to tension in the muscle. So incomplete tetanus means you do not have complete tension. It is doing this kind of thing, right? So it is contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing, okay? Riding on the wave of the previous contraction. This is how your muscles work all the time, okay? When you're lifting your coffee cup in the morning or you're walking around, it's incomplete tetanus. It's wave summation riding on the wave of the first one. Now another thing that we can see as a graded response is something called complete tetanus. So in this example, what you'll notice is that these stimuli coming down your brain and down those nerves are given so fast that the muscle does not have time to relax at all. Instead, it contracts and stays contracted and it's contracting at peak contraction. Like, it, you can't get a stronger contraction than what you're getting here. Not relaxing at all. So we call this complete tetanus because it's not dropping off. You're not dropping any tension off. You're not riding on the wave of the previous one. It is completely fused. You have very, very strong contraction here. This is not how your muscles work every day, okay? Complete tetanus. Um, an example, have you all ever heard of stories where like, I don't know, um, a baby is trapped under a car and a mom, the mom is able to lift the car and get her baby out? Like you've heard stories about people doing these things where they just have this spurt of superhuman strength. That's complete tetanus. Um, so this is only in certain circumstances do we have this in our muscles. Um, and it's usually driven by adrenaline. So this is not how our muscles are working every day. Okay, I'm going to go back. This is how your muscles are working every day. They are using these graded response, specifically wave summation or incomplete tetanus. Okay, this is how they work all the time. Superhuman strength would be that complete tetanus. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about your graded responses, right? Um, in order for you to even get a contraction, for your muscle to, for you to see a contraction in your muscle, the stimulus has to be strong enough to hit threshold, right? Now we've talked about that term threshold. Remember it's negative 50 to negative 55 millivolts. So let's go back to that whiteboard with my chicken scratch on there. Okay, so remember I told you that when acetylcholine moves across the cleft the, and binds to receptors, these sodium channels open and the inside gets more positive, we depolarize. And if we depolarize to threshold, we get an action potential that spreads down the sarcolemma and down the T-tubes. You only get an action potential if you hit threshold. 
So when we say that we have this threshold stimulus, that's what that means. It means that this stimulus has to be strong enough for you to hit this threshold here at the motor end plate to get an action potential, okay? And once an action potential starts, you can't stop it. You will get a contraction. So threshold stimulus is just the strength the stimulus has to be for you to hit threshold at that motor end plate and get an action potential so that you can get a contraction. That's all that means. Um, if the stimulus is stronger than threshold, your muscle will contract stronger. Okay, um, and the force of a contraction, so how strong of a contraction you're getting is controlled by motor units. More motor units mean a stronger contraction. If you recruit in more and more motor units, you're gonna get more and more cells in the muscle contracting and you'll get a stronger contraction. And we call this phenomenon recruitment, okay? I'm gonna show you a picture of it and talk about it. I'm super visual, so it always helps, I think, if we have a picture. So these three images up here, they all go together, okay? So I'm gonna talk about each one and then we'll put them all together. So at the very top, what we're looking at is the stimulus, how strong that stimulus is coming down a neuron, okay? And so you can see on the y-axis, this is the voltage of the stimulus, how strong is it? And the arrow, the, the size of the arrow tells you how strong it is. Obviously, the taller the arrow, the stronger the stimulus. In the middle, this image in the middle, this is showing you motor units. So another way you can think about this is this would be like cells. How many cells in there are contracting? And so they're lighting up in that darker red, that sort of um, coral color, if they're contracting, if the cell is, is um, getting a contraction. And then the bottom graph is just showing you tension in the muscle. So how much tension has that muscle generated? Okay, so we're gonna start with number one at the very top. So you can see here, so we have, whoops. So we have a stimulus here. Notice that the length of that arrow is really short. And right here, this white line shows you threshold. That's our negative 50 to 55. So right here, this first stimulus does not even hit threshold. If it doesn't hit threshold, then we don't generate an action potential. If you don't get an action potential, you don't get the muscle contracting. You don't get the sarcomere shortening. So notice down here at the bottom, there is no tension in the muscle. And notice right here in the middle, none of those cells are contracting. Number two, same thing. So the arrow is a little taller, so the stimulus is a little stronger, but it still is not hitting threshold. So we're still getting no, no motor units. Nothing's contracting, no tension in the muscle down here. Number three, just barely hits threshold. So notice we get two motor units lighting up. So you're gonna get a contraction. It's gonna be little, but you're gonna get one. And notice what happens as four, five, six, as the stimulus gets stronger and stronger, notice what's happening. We're getting more and more motor units that are contracting here. So notice those cells are lighting up. And notice the tension in the muscle is getting greater. Now eventually we're gonna hit a point right here at number seven where we have stimulus that is hitting something called the maximum stimulus. We call it the maximum stimulus because notice right here, we are lighting up every motor unit. Every motor unit, every cell in that muscle is contracting. So when we hit maximum stimulus, we're gonna get a maximum contraction, right? So that muscle is gonna contract as hard as it possibly can. Now, we can keep giving a stimulus above our maximum stimulus, but you can't get a stronger contraction, right? And the reason is there are no more motor units. Okay, we can't light up any more cells. So we can't possibly get a stronger contraction. So you can give a stronger stimulus, you just can't get a contraction more than maximum contraction. Okay, this is a phenomenon called recruitment. We are recruiting more and more motor units, okay, until we get our maximum contraction. So this is how your muscles can contract harder and harder and harder, depending on what you need. 
So um, in my face-to-face -face class, when I do this face-to-face, um, -face, we have this old, old machine that I usually will pull out and I will always hook somebody up to it. I put electrodes um, on, their, on their bicep and I have them sit in a chair and we stack textbooks on their arm, on their hand. And what we see is their bicep contracting harder and harder trying to hold the weight of all these textbooks that we're adding. And we can actually see it on a screen. So we can see the tension in that bicep going up. So we can actually see recruitment happening. It's pretty cool, okay? So this is just your, this is how your muscles work all the time through recruitment. You recruit more and more motor units if you need more tension in the muscle. You have a stronger stimulus, you get more motor units. Now this phenomenon called staircase effect, this is also a great, this is part of our graded potentials. This is how your muscles work. The staircase effect means that you're gonna get a stronger contraction to the same exact stimulus. Let me show you a picture. Okay, so here's a picture of the staircase effect. So notice that we give a contract, we give a stimulus, the muscle is gonna contract and relax back to zero. We give another stimulus. Notice what happens. It's the same stimulus, but we get a stronger contraction. We give the same stimulus, an even stronger contraction. This is not wave summation. Remember wave summation, let's go back, was this one. You're getting a stronger contraction because it's riding on the wave of the first one. The staircase effect is not riding on the wave of anything but we're given the same stimulus. We're just getting stronger contractions as we go. This is the phenomenon why, behind why it's so important that you warm up before you compete. And that's because if your muscles are nice and warm, then they're gonna be contracting at peak efficiency. And that's what this is showing you. So this is just showing you that as your muscles warm up, your enzymes become more available and it makes calciums more available and it makes getting that contraction faster and it makes it better. So you have a better contraction in your muscle if they're nice and warm. So this is sort of the, the again, this is sort of that warm up period for athletes and this is why we do this. It allows us to increase the availability of calcium in that sarcoplasmic reticulum and the enzymes become a little more efficient in our muscles. Okay. So that's called the staircase effect. Okay, so we have just walked through basically how whole muscles contract. That's all we're going to talk about. Now your book goes into a lot more. Um, it talks about slow twitch muscle fibers and fast twitch muscle fibers. We're not going to go into all of that. Um, you just need to know that they, they work through a graded response. Okay, through that incomplete wave summation. Um, we call that incomplete tetanus. And um, we have that staircase effect and we have recruitment. Okay, so you just need to know some of those things. Um, the next thing I'm gonna walk you through is a little bit on muscle metabolism. So this is, how are you generating, how are you getting ATP in your muscles? Because remember, we have to have ATP. Let me go back to our whiteboard. We need ATP right here. So remember in the drawing that we did that looked way better than this one last week? Remember in order to get that sarcomere to get shorter, we have to have ATP, right? That's essential for those cross bridge formations. So we have to have ATP. So what I wanna walk you through is how do we get that ATP? You're, you burn through so much energy every day through so much ATP that you make your own body weight in it every day. So you burn it almost as fast as you're making it. And so how are our muscles making it since it's so important? So let's walk through that. That's muscle metabolism. Um, so ATP is pretty much the on only energy source that your muscles can use. Now your muscles do have stores of ATP. They can actually store it. Um, but because they burn through it so fast, they'll burn through their stores of ATP within four to six seconds of activity. Now, I don't know about you, um, but 
when I work out and I go to the gym, I usually do it for longer than four to six seconds. <laughs> that usually feels like about three hours, but it's not, but it feels like that, that long. Um, but it's definitely longer than four to six seconds, right? So you have to have other ways to make ATP. You can't just rely on the stores of ATP. You can't do much of anything in only four to six seconds, right? You can't even get out of your car and walk into the grocery store in four to six seconds. So the other ways that we generate ATP, one, I'm going to walk you through each of these three ways. One of them is through um, something called creatine phosphate. We call that direct phosphorylation. Oops, I'm running out of room. Another is through anaerobic glycolysis. You might have heard of this as anaerobic respiration, same thing. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So this is what's gonna happen if you don't have enough oxygen. And then we also have aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration means cellular respiration, and this is with oxygen. So these are the different ways that your muscles can continue to generate ATP after they've used up their stores of ATP. So here are some images of those, okay? So the first one that we're gonna walk through is direct phosphorylation. Now I'm gonna talk about it here and then I'll talk about it a little bit more. So one of the things that I talked to you about last week is where ATP is getting used in muscle fizz. So remember in that cross bridge formation and forming a power stroke and detaching, that's where we're using all our ATP. And I mentioned to you last week that how we use ATP is we have to spend it. We spend it by breaking a phosphate off, right? So we take adenosine triphosphate, break a phosphate off, and we're left with adenosine diphosphate. That's what we're left with, that's the byproduct. It'd be super easy to recycle that and turn ADP back into ATP, right? All we would have to do is add phosphate to it. That's what we do. So your body does a great job of recycling all of that spent ATP, which is ADP. So your body takes adenosine diphosphate with the help of creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate tells you it has a phosphate on it. All we're going to do is take the phosphate off of creatine phosphate and give it to ADP. And what we're going to be left with now is just plain old creatine. And here is our ATP. So all we're doing is taking ADP and adding a phosphate to it and turning it back into ATP. So this is one way that we can recycle ADP and turn it back into ATP. Okay, so that's direct phosphorylation. Another way that we can make ATP, which I'm sure y'all are familiar with, I know you talked a lot about this in general biology, and that is um, aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration, obviously aerobic uses oxygen, so this is with the help of oxygen. This is going to use food stuff, so it's going to use the things that you eat, like carbohydrates mainly, um, but if you don't have carbohydrates, people that are on these sort of low-carb, no-carb diets, um, if you don't have carbs, you're going to burn lipids, and if you don't have fat, um, that usually is only in the case of starvation, but if you don't have any fat left, uh, then you'll start burning through protein. So you can use other things with the help of oxygen to make energy, right, and it's always going to be stuff you're consuming. It's food stuff. So in aerobic respiration, we're looking at glucose, which again, glucose is just a carbohydrate. So we're going to take glucose with the help of oxygen, and we turn that into, your book says 32 ATPs. It's really more like 36 to 38 ATPs. So we're going to turn that into a lot of ATP. Now, have you ever worked out so hard that you're breathing like this? <laughs> and you feel like you can't catch your breath and you can't talk to somebody next to you, you're probably not going through aerobic respiration anymore. You're probably going through anaerobic respiration. And typically what happens in that case is you have worked your muscles out so hard that they're swelling and they're pushing on their own blood supply and you can't get the oxygen into that muscle very well. 
And if you don't have oxygen, you can still make energy. We just do anaerobic respiration. And we're going to take glucose and do the same process, but if you don't have any oxygen, you really don't make as much energy. You only make about two ATPs instead of 36 to 38. So this has no oxygen. So those are the different ways that we can generate ATP. All right, so let's go through these, um, just looking at them in a different, a different way instead of just at that image. So the first one I mentioned was direct phosphorylation. Um, and so remember, that's where we're going to recycle our ATP. So we're going to take all that ADP that we have left over and our creatine phosphate, which we store in our muscles, and we're going to put that phosphate onto our ADP, right? And we're going to be left with creatine and ATP. Now, this is really helpful. It's a great way to recycle, um, like I mentioned, but you only have enough creatine phosphate in your muscles to, to recycle ADP for about 20 seconds of activity. Okay, so let's think about this. So right now, you in your muscles, you have stores of ATP. Just using up ATP, the stores that are in your muscle, you have enough energy for about four to six seconds. Then your muscles are gonna start to use creatine phosphate and that'll give you another 20 seconds of activity. So we're up to about 25, 30 seconds of activity. Again, we're usually moving a lot longer than that. So that's where aerobic respiration comes in. Once we've used our stores of creatine phosphate, we flip into aerobic respiration. Here is the official equation for cell respiration for aerobic respiration. I typically will write it like this. Oops, carbs plus oxygen forms CO2 plus water plus ATP, right? So you have the actual equation that's balanced up there, but I always write it the way that I did right here. Um, and I do that just because it makes it easy to remember, okay? You're taking carbohydrates that you eat and oxygen that you breathe in, okay? And the wastes are gonna be CO2, you blow it out, some water, and there's your ATP and you make a lot of it, 36 to 38 ATP molecules. You have to have oxygen for this to happen, right? That is one of the reactants. You gotta have carbs, gotta have oxygen. This is super efficient. And in someone who's well conditioned, aerobic respiration can last hours. So if you are like, if I don't go to the gym, I walk. Um, and I typically walk about four to five miles a day. Well, I, that's all aerobic respiration. I'm not huffing and puffing. I'm not struggling. I can do that with aerobic respiration. Now, if I tried to walk 15 miles, I'd probably at some point flip into anaerobic respiration. So at some point, you've kind of hit your max and you're going to flip into anaerobic respiration, okay? A lot of times this happens because your muscles are contracting so much and they're starting to swell up. So muscle contractility reaches about 70% maximum. You've just worked out too much or too hard. Your muscles start to bulge. They push on their own blood vessels, right? And if they're pushing on their own blood vessels, then you are not getting carbs and oxygen into the muscle, okay? And so it's going to impair oxygen delivery. And so instead, you're going to go through anaerobic respiration. And this is where you are going to turn glucose into only two ATPs. Also, there is a byproduct that is produced during anaerobic respiration called lactic acid. Some people think that this is what causes your muscles to have that really sore feeling after you've worked out and you've gone through anaerobic respiration, um, is that lactic acid that's building up in there. Um, usually, if you work out and your muscles get really sore, like let's say you've lifted weights or you've done a ton of squats and you've done things you're not used to doing and you have that sore feeling, um, the best thing you can do, nobody wants to do it, but the best thing you can do to flush that lactic acid out is to work out again. Um, get your muscles working out, get the blood pumping to them and it'll help flush that out. Again, this process makes a lot less ATP, but it can get your muscles to continue to contract. So 
I love this image because this takes those three different ways that we can generate ATP and puts them in an image for you, okay? So in blue up here, we have exercises that are quick, sprinting, for example. Um, so let's look at if you're going to sprint, what, is your mu what are your muscles going to use for energy? Well, remember, you're going to use about four to six seconds of just stores of ATP, right? Once you've burned up that, then you're going to use that creatine phosphate and you're going to re recycle ATP from ADP. That'll give you another 20 seconds or so, 10 to 20 seconds. And then in a sprint, you're probably going to bump into anaerobic respiration. Um, you know, if you think of like Olympic sprinters and people who are really doing these quick, short bursts of activity, you're not, you're not in anaerobic, you're not in aerobic respiration, you're in anaerobic respiration. So you're going to just use no oxygen, you're going to pump out the ATP as best you can. Now, if someone's doing a prolonged activity, so let's say that you are used to running and um, you are training for a marathon. And so maybe to train for that marathon, you have been running 10 miles a day. You're going to go through stores of ATP. You're going to use creatine phosphate. And then you're going to come over here and go into aerobic respiration. And again, someone who's well conditioned, you can do this for hours. So aerobic endurance is essentially the length of time that your muscles can continue to contract using aerobic pathways. Someone who's well conditioned, this can last a really long time. Um, I had a friend who was training for marathons and he would run like 10, 15 miles a day. And then right before the marathon, he would run like 20 miles. And then that pushed his limit. That would push his aerobic endurance. And obviously the marathon itself would push his aerobic endurance. The anaerobic threshold is that point at which muscle metabolism converts into anaerobic respiration. Okay, so you would use stores of ATP, you would use creatine phosphate and aerobic respiration for as long as possible. But at some point, you're gonna hit that anaerobic threshold and you're gonna flip over into anaerobic respiration and you'll be sore the next day. Here are some different activities um, that might cause you to um, use different means of, of generating ATP. Typically, activities that are short, that don't last long, that require quick bursts of energy, like sprinting and weightlifting. These, if they're really, really short, you're going to use stores of ATP and creatine phosphate. And that's it. You're not using anything else. Um, you're not using aerobic or anaerobic respiration. And so a lot of times um, weightlifters, they'll, they'll take like creatine supplements. They're trying to increase their stores of creatine phosphate in their muscles so that they can maybe do a couple of reps and set their dumbbells down and they're not flipping into anaerobic respiration. They don't want their muscles to bulge. They don't want their muscles uh, to go through anaerobic respiration. On and off activities that last a long time, like tennis and soccer, these are using anaerobic respiration. And then prolonged endurance activities, um, jogging, people who run marathons, long distance swimmers, triathletes, these are all people who would be using aerobic respiration. Okay, so different activities would require different means of generating ATP. So I feel like all of these things, when we talk about muscle metabolism, these are things that you probably already are familiar with. Um, anytime you use a muscle, your muscle is going to get bigger, right? It's going to increase in size. It is going to increase in strength and it's going to become more efficient. Now, one thing that I want to tell you I'm going to put a star down here because I don't have this on the slide anywhere. When your muscles get bigger, like if you're working out, you're lifting weights, your muscles are getting bigger. It is not because you are getting more muscle cells. You don't have a lot of stem cells for your muscles. You're not generating more muscle cells. Your muscle cells themselves are actually getting bigger. 
you are generating more actin and myosin inside the cell and the cell is getting beefier. And if all those muscle cells get bigger, then the whole muscle gets bigger. So I'm gonna write down here that muscle cells get bigger because they get more actin and myosin. So they get more of those proteins in there. You are not getting more muscle cells inside your muscle to get your muscle to be bigger. You are getting more actin and myosin in the muscle cell and the muscle cell is swelling. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Unfortunately though, if you are not using your muscle, your muscles will get weaker and waste away and it happens fast. So I typically will normally non pre-COVID, my, my son calls this COVID season, so pre-COVID season, um, I would go to the gym about three times a week and do some type of weight training. It's really older, it's really older, it's really important, especially for women as we get older, to do some kind of weight training, to lift weights, because remember your bones remodel based on the demands you put on them. So just doing aerobic activities, ladies, it's not enough. We've got to add some weight to our, to our bones so that we can get our bones stronger, especially as we get older and get closer to menopause, because remember, our bones will get weaker as we age. Um, we don't have those protective benefits of estrogen anymore as we get older. So before COVID, I would go and do, you know, do some weights. I'm not saying I would do like 20 pound dumbbells or anything, but um, I would lift weights, usually like 10 pound dumbbells for bicep curls, which, I, you know, that was pretty good. Um, and I, because of COVID, have not been to the gym in like, was it been like seven months? So I just started going back and I did my weight classes on Thursday and Friday last week. And I can't do 10 pound dumbbells anymore. I'm back to five pounds. So the amount of strength that I've lost in my muscles over these last seven months is huge. So your muscles, if you don't use them, they will get weaker and they will waste away and it happens fast. So it is so important that we keep up with doing some kind of weight training. Um, don't stop doing that. So these are some of the effects of exercise that we see on our muscles. Um, obviously, if you're doing aerobics, aerobics is great for you. Um, please don't think I'm telling you don't do aerobic activities. Aerobic activities are wonderful. They're wonderful activities for your heart and your cardiovascular system, but also for your muscles. Um, the changes that we see in our muscles when we do aerobic activities, one is that you will actually get more capillaries in your muscles. That should make sense. If you're doing aerobic activities where you need the oxygen to your muscles, your body will naturally add more capillaries in your muscles so you can get more oxygen to your muscles. So you'll see more capillaries. You're also gonna see more mitochondria. Now that's not something I talked about when we did our muscle metabolism a couple minutes ago, but you all should be familiar with aerobic respiration, right? I'm gonna flip back. We touched on it, but I'm going to go back to this picture. Um, remember when you do, when you talk about cell respiration and aerobic respiration, you're taking glucose, you're breaking it down into pyruvic acid. That happens outside of mitochondria. That pyruvic acid goes into the mitochondria and goes through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So aerobic respiration, you have to have the mitochondria for that. So if you're going through aerobic respiration, you're doing aerobic activities, not only are you going to add more capillaries to your muscles, but you're also going to start adding more mitochondria to your muscles because you're using them. Okay. So more capillaries, more mitochondria, you're also gonna get more myoglobin. Now this is something I talked about at the beginning of chapter nine. Myoglobin sounds a lot like hemoglobin, right? Myo means muscle. So myoglobin is um, vesicles that we find in the muscle that store oxygen, okay? Hemoglobin stores the oxygen in your blood. 
myoglobin stores it in your muscle. So you're going to store more oxygen in your muscles. All of these things are going to increase your aerobic endurance, right? So if you're doing aerobic activities and all these things start happening in your muscles, you'll be able to do aerobic activities longer and longer, right? So if you're not used to doing aerobic activities, you may start out walking and you may walk or jogging and you may jog a half a mile and that's all you can do before you flip into anaerobic respiration. But if every day you do a half a mile, eventually you'll get up to a mile doing aerobic activities and then a mile and a half um, because of all these changes happening. Now, if you're doing resistance activities, lifting weights, these are usually anaerobic activities. And so some of the changes we're gonna see in our muscles when you lift weights, you will have more mitochondria in your muscles. I told you when you lift weights, your muscles do get bigger, but it's not because you get more cells, it's because you get more actin and myosin. So you will see more myofilaments. You're also gonna store more glycogen. That'll make sense too, because if you're doing anaerobic respiration for every one glucose, you are only getting two ATP molecules. Well, you're gonna need to store more glucose. So you'll store more glucose in your muscles. Now I have down at the bottom, if you are doing any kind of resistance activities, even aerobic activities, it is always important that you work opposing muscle groups. You work out your bicep, you need to work out your tricep. I always say, um, and we'll talk about this in chapter 10, what one muscle does, another muscle will undo. So like if you are going to flex your forearm, okay, that's your bicep, to extend it back out, that's another muscle, right? So what one muscle does, another muscle will undo. And so those are the muscles you've got to work, those opposing muscle groups. And that's just so that your joint can stay stable. Because remember, we talked about your joints and how muscle tone is one of the most important things for joint stability. Another um, phenomenon, another thing that we'll see with our muscles, and this one I think is pretty self-explanatory, is something called the overload principle. Basically, this says that if you work out a muscle, your muscle's going to get stronger, but your muscle will adapt to the increased demands. And so in order for you to see more gain in your muscle, you are going to have to overload your muscle. Okay, so let me give you an example. So I went back to the gym for the first time in like seven months and I did a weight class and here I am now back to my little five pound dumbbells and I'm doing my biceps and I promise you five pounds was hard. And at the end, um, we, we call them tracks. We'll do biceps for like an entire song. So at the end of that song, I was lifting my uh, five pound dumbbells like this. <laughs> and I'm holding my breath trying to lift these weights because it's hard, right? Well, if I keep going and I go and I do my weight class three days a week, in a month, those five pounds, I'm going to be like this. Whoa, this is so easy. Nothing's happening. I'm not going to get more, more gain in my biceps by continuing with my five pounds. It'll start to get really easy. So I'll set down my five pounds and I'll pick up my seven pounds, right? I've got to overload the muscles and those seven pounds will start to be hard. So if you want to see more gain in your muscle, you are going to have to overload the muscle. That's all that means. Now, the very end of this chapter, um, the whole chapter so far really has focused on skeletal muscles, right? What skeletal muscles look like? How do they contract? How do the whole muscles contract? The very end of this chapter, I just want to touch on smooth muscle. I am not going to talk about cardiac muscle in this chapter. We will save cardiac muscle for anatomy too when we do the cardiovascular system and we talk about the heart. So the last thing we're going to touch on is smooth muscle. Um, remember, this is the muscle we find in our hollow organs. So we find this in places like your GI tract, right? Like your esophagus and your stomach and your intestines. How, is, how smooth muscle cells contract is very similar to skeletal muscle cells, but there are some differences. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go over physiologically what's happening again. All I'm going to do is talk about the differences between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. So 
remember smooth muscle cells look different. They have a shape that's kind of like this. It's more spindle shaped and it has one nucleus right in the middle. Okay, remember skeletal muscle cells are really long. We call them muscle fibers. Oops. And they have striations and the nuclei, there's multiple nuclei in there and they're kind of mushed to the outside. So those look very different from each other. Um, and another big difference is that your smooth muscle is organized in two sheets. So you'll always have smooth muscle, a layer of smooth muscle running one way and then a layer of smooth muscle running the other way, okay? And so I am going to do a whiteboard and I'm going to show you, I'll draw the smooth muscle out for you, okay? So smooth muscle cells, so um, I'm going to just draw a tube, right? Because remember, this is what lines our hollow organs, okay? So here I've got a tube, let's say it's the esophagus. You will have smooth muscle cells that run around the esophagus this way. And we call that the circular layer. Oops, that's not how you spell that. Okay, so that's our circular layer. If those cells were to contract, that tube would look very different, right? These are cells running all the way around the tube. And if they were to squeeze, that tube would get real skinny, right? So it would go from looking like what we have here to looking like that, right? So that tube would get kind of long and skinny. The other layer is called the longitudinal layer. Okay, so this would be cells that are running this way. The longitudinal cells, if they were to squeeze and contract, the tube would also look different, right? So it would go from looking like that to looking more like that, right? It would kind of get short and fat. So what you always have with smooth muscle is you have one layer of circular cells and then around that you have a layer of longitudinal cells. So it would look something like this. So you'd have your circular layer, but then you also have on top of that longitudinal layer, okay? And so these are going to contract rhythmically. Um, you might have areas where only the circular layer is contracting, and then you'll have other areas where the longitudinal layer is contracting. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. And so we say these are always organized in those two sheets. Okay, and so that, that rhythmic contraction that we get between the longitudinal and the circular layer is something called peristalsis. And this is what is going to allow substances to move through that passageway. So you might have, let's say you swallow your food. I don't like that, how that turned out. All right, let's see. Let's say you swallow your food you're going to have your circular layer contracting to help squeeze the food down and wherever the food is it's going to be kind of bulging where you have that big bolus of food right so the circular layer might be contracting up here and the longitudinal layer might be contracting down here okay so they're rhythmic contractions the way i think of peristalsis is like um i don't know if any of y'all have children but my child um the the toothpaste tube drives me insane with my child. He will pick up the toothpaste and squeeze it from the middle. And so then there's like a big hunk of toothpaste at the end of the tube and there's some at the front and then he'll go, we're out of toothpaste. And I'm like, no, we're not. 
And I'll take the tube and I'll squeeze it from the back and I'll squeeze all the toothpaste up to the front, right? And you get this big ball of toothpaste now at the front. And that is what I think of in my mind when I think of peristalsis, as I think of like squeezing the toothpaste tube, right? Getting that toothpaste up to the front so that you can use up everything in that tube. Now, a couple of other differences between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Um, Smooth muscle does not have a neuromuscular junction. So remember, that is this part right here with our skeletal muscle, right? That's that neuromuscular junction where we have the acetylcholine receptors and the motor end plate. We don't see that with smooth muscle. Instead, smooth muscle looks like this. So in pink, you can see the muscle. Now what you see is you see a neuron coming in and the neuron has these big bulges, right? You can see these bulges here. Those are called varicosities. Those have neurotransmitters in them. And instead of having this, like we have back here, instead of having this very distinct neuromuscular junction between one neuron and one cell, instead, you can kind of see there's just varicosities all over the place. And we call these diffuse junctions. They're not specific. They're just in this area of smooth muscle. So they'll release neurotransmitters in this area and the smooth muscle will pick it up and contract. Okay, so it's very different. It's not nearly as specific. So I remember this and this is what makes me think of this. I'm gonna leave out all the guys and I'm just talking to the girls right now. But I think of like when you are on your cycle and you have cramps. Think about, you know, your uterus is smooth muscle. And so those neurons, those varicosities, those diffuse junctions, they're sending the neurotransmitter into the general area of where your uterus is. And so that's why you get those cramps and contractions. But you also have cramps other places, right? Sometimes you'll get cramps in the stomach. Sometimes you'll get cramps in like the colon and in your rectum. That's because that's all smooth muscle and it's a diffuse junction. So you're releasing these neurotransmitters just sort of in the area of where the uterus is, but other smooth muscle can pick it up, okay? So that might help you. Sorry guys, <laughs> I left you out. All right, the very last thing in this chapter is just some developmental aspects of your muscles. Um, so your muscle tissues develop from embryonic tissue called mesoderm. So remember when we talked about an embryo, you have a big ball of cells and there's like three layers in there. The mesoderm is in the middle. Um, mesoderm gives rise to connective tissues and muscles, okay? And the muscle cells are called myoblasts. That should make sense, right? Myo is muscle and blast is always the immature muscle building cell. Skeletal muscle cells are caused by the fusion of lots of myoblasts. This is why they're multinucleate. Okay, I'm gonna star that because you're gonna see a question about that probably on your exam. Now we'll usually have sarcomeres present around the seventh week. So that means that the muscle can contract around the seventh week. Um, my husband and I had to do fertility treatments to have our son. And when you go through, when you go through infertility and you do fertility treatments, um, you find out you're pregnant really early because of a blood test, because everything is timed. So I had a blood test, I knew I was pregnant before I even missed a period. And from the time you know you're pregnant, they start doing ultrasounds. And I had an ultrasound every single week. And I remember going in at week seven and I asked the nurse during the ultrasound, um, at this point he looked kind of like a gummy bear or like a little frog almost on the ultrasound. Um, his little legs were kind of long. And I remember asking, I said, oh, do you think we'll see him move? And she was like, no. She said, not usually. But I know that the sarcomeres are present by week seven. She said, not usually, usually around week eight or nine, we can see him move. And my little boy, when they did that ultrasound, his little legs moved, it kind of kicked out. And I was like, ah! I was super excited. Um, and so, um, but we do, there are sarcomeres present by week seven, so the muscles are moving. However, they are not moving voluntarily. 
um, usually that doesn't happen until much later. Um, and that's because there is a growth factor. I'm going to star this one too. You need to know this. There is a growth factor called agrin that gets released that causes acetylcholine receptors to form at the motor end plate. And so until you have those acetylcholine receptors, skeletal muscles are not under voluntary control. Okay, so let's explain why that is. Okay, so let's think about, here's your neuron, here's your skeletal muscle, All right? Let's look at that neuromuscular junction. So I'm not gonna draw in any acetylcholine receptors, okay? But we still have acetylcholine up here in the neuron. So an impulse comes down a neuron. That's gonna cause calcium channels to open and calcium comes in, right? These vesicles move to the end and release acetylcholine in the cleft. If there are no receptors on the motor end plate, the skeletal muscle has no idea that the neuron even sent a signal, right? So it's not until agrin that gets released, that growth factor, and you get acetylcholine receptors forming on this motor end plate that now you can respond to acetylcholine being released. Okay, so this is why skeletal muscles are not under voluntary control until you have those receptors. Whoops, let me go back to our slideshow. Okay. Um, now, a lot of times in an infant, we'll see muscular development reflect neuromuscular coordination. Um, and usually what we'll see is it goes from head to toe, proximal to distal. So what that means is, um, if you think of a baby, think of an infant. When a baby is born, you kind of have to cradle them and you have to hold their head because they can't lift their head up, right? But eventually, the first thing a baby is going to be able to do is lift their head up by themselves. And then the next thing they're going to be able to do is sit by themselves, right? Um, I remember um, my son, when he was little, he was able to hold his head up, but he couldn't sit by himself without just like falling over. So we'd put him in that little boppy seat, right? So that they kind of sit up and it holds them up. And then eventually they're going to start crawling. So we're going head to toe, okay? And then eventually they'll walk and also proximal to distal, meaning from shoulder out to fingers or hips out to toes. So think about this, right? Um, like little kids, um, when I gave my son at one and two years old a crayon to draw on paper, it was like this, right? Scratches all across the paper. And then eventually, um, when he was three and four and five, he started coloring in the lines. And it wasn't big scratches all over the paper. He got better at that fine control. So we go head to toe, proximal to distal. Usually peak neural control of muscles is around mid-adolescence, but athletics and training can really improve neuromuscular control. Um, my son plays hockey, and a lot of the hockey players have this sort of um, balance board. It's a board that's on basically a tube, and they'll stand on it and balance, and then they'll stick handle while they're standing on that board. That is really improving that neuromuscular control. Oh, I like this slide. So this one talks about the difference between men and women. Um, there is a biological reason why men are stronger than women. And it pains me to say this, but men are stronger physiologically than women are. Um, and the reason is because in terms of muscle mass, men have more. Men, their body is about 42% muscle mass, whereas women, ours is only about 36%. And there is a reason for that. It has to do with our hormones. Um, testosterone that men release cause them to have a greater muscle mass. Um, so this is all due to that sex hormone testosterone. So with more muscle mass, obviously men are typically stronger. However, I like this part, I'm going to start it. <laughs> per unit muscle mass, we are equal in strength, right? So if men also had 36% muscle mass for their body, then we would be equal. Or if women had 42% muscle mass, we would be equal. Okay, so per unit mass, we're the same. Men just have more. 
All right, so as we get older, there are obviously changes that happen in our muscles. Um, connective tissue starts to go up as we get older and your, we know connective tissue does not contract and your muscle fibers will start to get smaller. You'll lose your actin and myosin. This is called sarcopenia. This is natural, so this is not a disorder. Okay, this is the natural aging process and it starts at 30. 30, you start losing muscle mass. By 80, 50% 50 of your muscle mass is lost. I don't know if y'all if y'all are on social media, but um, on Facebook there was a video of a woman that was in her 80s who I guess was a gymnast and she was doing like splits and she was doing like the parallel bars. It was amazing at 80. Um, and so obviously by continuing to do activities like that, you're going to maintain your muscle mass, which is really important. It keeps your bones nice and strong too. Regular exercise is what can reverse sarcopenia, can keep it from happening. So it is so important to exercise. I do want to talk about a few disorders at the end of this chapter. Um, one of them is muscular dystrophy. This is a muscle destroying disease. It causes your muscles to get large and they're not getting large because of actin and myosin, they're getting large because of fat deposits. And we know fat and other forms of connective tissue do not contract. So the muscles get bigger, but they get less contractile. And as the muscles getting bigger, your muscle cells are atrophying. They're dying. One form of muscular dystrophy is called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a genetic disorder. It is an X-linked disorder, which means it's carried by females, but it's typically only expressed in males. Usually this gets diagnosed between the ages of two and seven, so diagnosed very early. And the symptoms are clumsy and frequent falls. Now, I remember my two-year-old, when he was walking and running, he would fall all the time, trip over his own feet. Um, that's not what this means. Um, typically what we see with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there is a natural progression in children um, with neuromuscular control where when they start walking, they're very clumsy and they'll just get better and better and better over time. What we'll see with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that a child may start crawling and walking and doing well, and then they start reverting. So they might go from being able to walk and doing okay to then start falling very frequently. And then they start crawling again. They stop walking altogether. Um, and so that would be a, a flag, a warning flag. Eventually it affects all of the muscles in the body, um, head and neck muscles. You cannot hold up your head any longer. I mean, you cannot lift up a spoon and feed yourself. Um, so eventually it'll even affect respiratory and cardiac muscles as well. So most people that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy have a very short life. They usually die somewhere around the age of 20 from either cardiac failure or respiratory arrest. What causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy is, and this is why we call it this, um, normally in your muscle cells, there is a protein called the dystrophin protein. It's a protein that stabilizes the sarcolemma and keeps it from tearing. So let me do our slideshow or our whiteboard here. Okay, so you have a protein. I'll just draw it. Um, I'll just do a little blue here. You've got this dystrophin protein all along the sarcolemma and it is there again just to stabilize the sarcolemma and keep it from tearing. Someone who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy does not have those dystrophin proteins. What happens is every time the muscle cell contracts and relaxes, you get little tears in the muscle if you do not have that protein. And those little tears allow calcium to come in, right? We know calcium is the go signal for a contraction, but y'all already know that too much of anything is bad. And if you get a ton of calcium in a muscle cell, it causes the muscle cell to start to degrade. So someone who has um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy will get tears, they get calcium coming in, causes actin and myosin to degenerate, and it causes the muscle to degenerate over time. 
There is no cure. This is a genetic condition. Um, they can give steroids, anabolic steroids, to beef up your muscle mass and make them bigger, knowing that they are going to start to decline eventually. Um, there are some very promising treatments with things like gene therapy. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned gene therapy before. Um, gene therapy is if they know the malfunctioning gene. So in this case, it is a gene that produces this protein, the dystrophin protein. So if they know the sequence of that gene and they know it's not functioning, what they can do is they can take that correct sequence of DNA, they insert it into a virus, okay, so they take all viral DNA out and they insert this gene, this correct gene, into a virus, then they infect you with the virus. Viruses replicate by inserting that DNA into your cells, so what they're doing is they're actually causing you to get that new gene that works correctly. Um, so gene therapy is super promising, um, however, it's very controversial because you are changing someone's genetic makeup. You're adding a gene into somebody, you're changing their makeup. Um, so it is controversial, but super promising, not just for this, but for any um, genetic mutation in the body. I've mentioned rigor mortis. I mentioned this last week. This is when your muscles get really stiff after death, usually happens a couple hours after death. This is because calcium leaks into the cells causes a cross bridge to form, but without ATP, you cannot detach the cross bridge and you're not making any ATP when you're dead, right? Because you have no oxygen, you not, you don't have anything. So you can't detach the cross bridge. So the sarcomere is kind of stuck in a position and your muscle fibers are stuck. Um, eventually rigor mortis will peak after about 12 hours to 18 hours as actin and myosin break down. Now this is a disorder. This is not the same thing as sarcopenia. Disuse atrophy is when your muscles are completely immobilized and you will start to lose muscle mass. This is usually if somebody has paralysis um, and you will lose a lot of muscle mass if they are completely paralyzed. You'll lose 5% per day, so that's huge. If it's because of paralysis, if it's nerve damage, a lot of times what they can do is they can um, stimulate your muscle with like a TENS unit. So again, they bypass the nerve. Um, they're going to just put the shock right on the muscle, get the muscle to contract. This helps to prevent scar tissue and fibrous tissue and fat tissue from building up in the muscle so that if you are able to regain neurological control, you can use your muscles again. Um, so I don't know if y'all remember, um, you were in Tuscaloosa, most of you, but it was a Hoover high school football player, Ben Abercrombie, who went to Harvard to play football, and his very first game was tackled, and he uh, damaged his spinal cord in the cervical region. And um, at first they thought he had spinal shock, which is just swelling of the cord. Um, but now we know that's not the case. This was a couple years ago. Um, he is doing extensive physical therapy, but he is quadriplegic. He cannot move his arms or legs. They are doing lots of physical therapy with him. And part of that includes doing muscle stimulation to keep his muscles contracting, okay? It can delay that atrophy. Okay, so that is it for chapter nine. Big, big chapter kind of divided up into three parts. Um, does anybody have any questions on chapter nine? 